realism is the critique that's included in the file. Um, and so we've got an intro to settler colonialism here. Um, settler colonialism as a critique really comes down to the question of whose land uh, we are currently occupying since all of us are residents of the settler state of the United States of America. Oh my goodness, will it not let me switch slides? Okay, there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna open with just like a small case study. Um, there was a day a few weeks ago where the Supreme Court released two decisions. One was to overturn Trump's attempt to get rid of DACA, uh, which protects undocumented, or yeah, protects people who were brought over as undocumented immigrants when they were children and their rights to get work and schooling um, while they're living here. Um, and the other decision that came out on that day was one that allowed the Dominion Appalachian Pipeline to continue construction through Haliwa support, Saponi and Lumbee land. Um, and so these were two very interesting decisions to come out on the same day because one of them was viewed as very progressive, the decision on DACA, and the other one was viewed as a pretty conservative response uh, in that it was allowing construction through forest property that also happened to run into native land um, that a lot of native tribes were very upset over. And so this sort of raises the question of, okay, so the Supreme Court can make decisions that we like because they help people and decisions that hurt people. Um, and how do we sort of reconcile that the Supreme Court is allowed to make both of these types of decisions? Um, does this mean that them ruling on DACA is bad because they're an institution that is allowed to make whatever decisions they want and they have the power to legitimize and delegitimize all sorts of different things? Um, or is it still a good step to take that the court is moving towards making more progressive decisions every once in a while? Um, and then the other question that this raises is what would it mean for the US to acknowledge the rights of indigenous people to their own land um, and to acknowledge that they have the right to have a say in what happens on their land uh, and what can and cannot take place there. So that was a little bit of like a lot of questions just being thrown out there, uh, but we'll get back to like why this is an interesting um, sort of juxtaposition of cases to come out at the same time. Okay, so basics of settler colonialism. Um, I'm sure all of you have heard of like colonization in general, like the idea of colonies, like Britain had India as a colony, it had the US as a series of colonies before the Revolutionary War. Um, Britain had colonies pretty much everywhere. Um, the US held the Philippines as a colony for a little bit. There's colonialism all over the place. And so the difference between colonialism as we conceptualize it for like Britain colonizing India um, and settler colonialism as we conceptualize it for the US being a settler colonial state is that in one case, the colonization is just to extract resources, extract labor, um, take over a country for a while without the intention of actually like sending people there to live and making it an actual place that those people are going to call home and want to stay in forever. Um, and a place where the settlers are there to stay and are there to try and build their own lives on that land. So when Britain pulled out of India, things could pretty much go back to normal. Um, they had just stolen a bunch of resources and a bunch of labor from people um, and done a bunch of bad things, but they still left eventually. Whereas with the US, the United States still exists on top of lands that has belonged to native people for centuries. So Patrick Wolf is a scholar who was one of the leading scholars in settler colonialism. And he said that colonization is a structure and not an event. Um, so his argument is that instead of colonization ending after the Revolutionary War, when you know the, col the colonies had happened, um, the US becomes a country, 
the U.S. decides that indigenous people can't hold their land anymore, the Trail of Tears and stuff happens, and eventually we get this country where it's the U.S. Native people live on reservations or they just kind of vanish. Um, and he says that that's not the correct way to look at it. Instead, that this is an ongoing structure that continues to rest on the erasure and genocide of Native people. The U.S. can't continue to exist if it acknowledges that the land rightfully belongs to Indigenous people um, and that Indigenous people were here with complex societies of their own, with their own nations, their own politics, their own everything before people got here and made a bunch of treaties with them that they broke and stole all of their land. So settler colonialism is the ongoing structuring logic of elimination against native peoples in order to justify and maintain that settler control of the land. Because settler colonialism is colonialism where the colonists are here to stay and want to assert their own right to the land. So this necessitates this um, continuation of taking the land from Native people, pretending that the, the land does not belong to Native people and never has, um, and then killing whatever Native people try to protest that um, and try to get in the way of the settler state. So sort of a question that comes out of this is how does this framing of thinking of the U.S. in terms of a settler colonial, colonial country conflicts with the narrative of U.S. history as it's often told to us. So y'all are all in high school. Y'all have all been in, or you've all been in history class before, um, and you've all heard, I'm sure, different narratives of the U.S. history and how the U.S. was established, how California was established, um, all of these things. Um, and so a lot of the way that that is told to you is directly in conflict with these ideas of the land hasn't always belonged to people in the U.S. There wasn't like a peaceful transfer of land um, and there's really oh yeah California missions projects that's a good thing to bring up. They banned those just like a couple years ago but I'm I guess a lot of you still had to do those. Um, yeah so that was a really messed up one where people had to build uh, model California missions, which were places where native people in California uh, were forcibly converted to Christianity, used for labor, slave labor, um, and many, many of them were killed uh, in the process of colonizing California because the settlers wanted the land, and so they had to get native people out of the way in order to do that. So, um, everybody clear on that so far? Cause, yeah, like there's gonna be questions at the end, but I understand that a lot of this is sort of like dumping a lot of heavy theory at once. So we're gonna move on. Uh, if you have any questions, either put them in the chat or write them down for later and we'll discuss. So, next question that a lot of people have, especially the good pro progressives is, what about the good things that the state does? Uh, the state, you know, the U.S. has done a lot of great things, like there's been a lot of great innovations and stuff like that. Maybe things are better this way. Well, firstly, uh, things are not, nothing justifies like continued genocide. Um, and so that's one big thing to always keep in mind when you're framing this is that it's not a question of like, oh, like things were bad in the past. This is like ongoing situations that impact Native people. Because even though like something like 40% of Americans don't know that Native people still exist, which is pretty wild to think about um, and kind of scary. But yeah, Native people do still exist, both like on Native reservations, which are still around, and also in cities, in suburbs, in towns. Like Native people are here. Um, and they're still facing a lot of these conditions of either they're forced to assimilate into society um, because they're still very negatively stereotyped. They still face a lot of um, violence 
that's disproportionately aimed at them. Um, Native people, Native men are actually the most highly incarcerated demographic by like percentage. Um, so, but like a lot of issues still face these communities and also Native reservations are hideously underfunded. Um, and a lot of them face really severe problems with lack of access to clean water, lack of access to electricity, lack of good education, all sorts of stuff like that. So these are things that are still around and still very much problems. They're not things that can just be pushed into the past and be like, oh, we messed up back then, but you know, things are better now. The other thing is, even when the state tries to legislate things that are seen as progress, they still really don't have that much of an impact in that sense. So like recently, uh, last week, the Supreme Court ruled that Oklahoma, a lot of Oklahoma is actually not the state of Oklahoma, but still a native reservation because that reservation was never officially disbanded by Congress. And that means that the state of Oklahoma has no legal jurisdiction over people there. Well, this was touted as a really big victory, but practically, it didn't really change very much. Native reservations are still under federal jurisdiction in the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Cases just go from being tried at the state level to being tried by federal courts for serious crimes. Um, and for smaller crimes, they can be tried through the tribal court system. But even that is still like overseen by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And all in all, no land changed hands. So all of the land that was claimed as state property and sold to people, the native tribes will never see any of that money. It's still under private ownership. Um, so even when the state does things that are seen as progress, a lot of the time they don't actually have an impact on people. And when they do, it's not in a way that actually changes who has the right to the land and who has sovereignty over the land, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, cool. And yes, Brooke, I am out here radicalizing the youth. Let's go. That's what camp is for, correcting the young. Okay, so um, the settler colonialism critique, getting more into the argument itself. Um, how does this all fit into a debate round? So the settler colonialism K builds off of these ideas of settler colonial theory uh, and critiques the assumption of US legitimacy and settler forms of knowledge and action. Um, so this is obviously a very broad statement. Um, and what I mean by that is that this critique can critique a lot of different aspects of debate. It can critique the content of the debate where policies are always focused on the US federal government, um, which settler colonialism would, like a settler colonial lens would view as an illegitimate institution, uh, an institution that's operating on stolen land as a colonizing entity. Um, but it can also critique uh, settler forms of knowledge, the types of evidence that people read, the types of institutions that they see as trustworthy, and settler forms of action as well. So different forms of mechanisms that people might try to use, um, different forms of activism that they might advocate for, stuff like that. So the aim of the critique is to unsettle uh, these assumptions and question the foundations that the AF rests on. Uh, and the end point of settler colonialism critiques are always or should always be towards decolonization, um, which even though it's not a movement that you will hear about very much on the TV um, or on the radio or in the news, um, decolonization is still very much a thing that a lot of Native people advocate for. And there are definitely ways that it can happen and steps that different people have taken towards trying to make it happen. Uh, so I can talk more about those later too, if you want. Uh, so when we get to the parts of the critique, uh, the first thing that I don't think we really talked about in the like parts of the K section of the lecture is uh, framing. And this is just sort of like a broad card for ideology case or a broad argument it doesn't have to be a card. Uh, that's pretty hypocritical of me to say. Um, but a, it's an argument that outlines what your ideology is that you're basing your critique around um, and sort of what the thesis of your critique is. So the framing of the settler colonialism K that you've been provided in the file 
is settler nationalism. And this idea of settler nationalism talks about how settler colonialism is a project of inclusion. Um, not in the sense of like, not in the good sense of like, oh, we want everybody to be invited to the party, but in the bad sense of like, ooh, um, we have taken over this space and now we are going to invite all of our friends. Um, and so because it operates under this project of inclusion, um, settler colonialism tries to envelop everybody into this nation, nation that has been built on stolen land. Um, and so there is a place within the organization of the United States for everyone on the land. Um, so everybody is sort of drawn into this vision of a melting pot of the US, even though there are definitively some people who have lived on this land for a long time, who have been invited to live on this land, and people who are just here because they're like, oof, move to America, gonna start a new life, have not been invited here, just camping out on somebody else's land. Um, and so it erases those distinctions, the distinctions between people who should have sovereignty over the land and people who are, for lack of a better term, like, I don't know, visitors, uninvited guests, stuff like that. Um, it erases those distinctions and instead sets up distinctions of race, of class, of gender, um, all of these settler colonial notions of who belongs in what category. So there, Native people are not people who have a long relationship to the land we're standing on, people who have a complex history uh, involved with that, um, and who have a right to the land that they're on, but instead another racial category within this multi-ethnic state that has been constructed. Um, and so this idea of settler nationalism is that this erasure of the land-based distinctions and a shift to distinctions of different settler categories produces violence towards those who don't fit into that vision. Um, it produces violence towards those who are put into undesirable categories by the settler state. And it produces violence towards those who try to reclaim the land that belongs to them, who try to um, do anything that acts outside of what the settler state has deemed acceptable and part of the order that it has constructed. Um, so it tries to bring everybody into that fold because it sees that as the way that um, it can get people to go along with this. If you give people some rights under your fake government, then you can more easily get those people to support you uh, when you go to try and take rights from somebody else. So the actual link to the critique is one of citizenship and settler amnesia. Um, like we just talked about on the framing issue, um, this forms of, the forms of inclusion that the state tries to create include ones like who is a citizen and who is a non-citizen. So rather than the land-based relation of who has a legacy on the land, who has been a steward of the land, and who has like a right to the land, the question becomes, who is a citizen of this state and who is not a citizen of this state. So it changes from a question of land to a question of belonging within the seller state. Um, and so an AF that's centered around immigration still acknowledges that the state has the power to legislate who is and is not a citizen and centers that as a question of racial inclusion rather than shifting the question to, well, a lot of the people who tried to immigrate from Latin America are indigenous people. A lot of them have more right to the land than the person sitting in the White House. Um, and so it shifts the question from one of who actually belongs to this land um, and who has a right to be here to one of who is included within this racial project of the United States and who can we legislate as acceptable and not acceptable. So it's shifting the boundaries of acceptability rather than trying to get rid of those altogether because they're just constructed. Um, and so then positioning that as a question of inclusion and civil rights and inclusion into the state ignores that the existence of the state itself is predicated on native dispossession and genocide. And that as long as the state exists, that is a necessary condition of its existence. 
the state will continue to pretend that Native people don't exist, pretend that Native people got themselves into their own situation, brought this on themselves by being people who are stereotyped as drunk and gamblers and like all of these horrible uh, stereotypes that aren't actually true or are conditions of the situation that people have been put in. Um, and it will pretend that this is a question of rights under the state and not one of stolen land. So um, the idea of settler amnesia is that willing forgetfulness of whose land this originally was and what has been done to maintain control over the land in favor of just acting as if the future in the future of the state is all that matters. And that's where we get to the white futurity impact. White futurity is the idea of <laughs> a future of whiteness, um, like it sounds like, uh, where it's sort of the, ima the white imagination of what the future, what, that there will be a future and what future should be expected. So the move to settler innocence or settler amnesia that ignores ongoing settler colonial violence in favor of improving the state and trying to be progressive within the state itself, that asserts that the settler state is a state that's just neutral, a state that's capable of redemption, a state that there's good things about, um, and not one that is actively violent all the time. So the idea of white futurity is we need to preserve the future of this state that is white, um, and we need to do that even though it comes at a cost, we're gonna pretend the cost doesn't exist because what matters is the future. Things will be worse in the future if we don't do X, Y, Z thing, even though there is current violence. So it's pretending that there isn't violence in the present to ensure a better future. Um, and then I have the meme of like the penguin solving racism because that's what the state claims to do like every couple decades. People were like, oof, Obama's president, America's not racist anymore. And it's like, uh, yeah, no. So two alternatives have been provided in the file. The first alternative in the file is one on embodied movements modeled after Idle No More, which is a movement that started in, um, it started in the settler state of Canada, um, but has crossed settler borders to become a uh, project of multiple different na native nations. Um, but it's locally based activism. Um, and the goal of the alternative is to find an ethical position as settlers and work to uphold treaties um, and calls for coalitionary action against the state. I don't know more itself is a little bit more radical than the card makes it out to be. Um, I don't know more is responsible for shutting down highways, shutting down transcontinental railway lines. They've done a lot of like very powerful work. Um, and so I think the card undersells a little bit like how powerful this movement has been. But uh, anyways, it's about trying to find a way to like make reparations for what sellers have done and work towards a future that is more ethical towards native people and in which native people have more sovereignty over the land. Um, which has upsides and downsides as an alternative, but that's what it is. The second alternative you've been provided in the file is to burn everything down. Um, it views the state as irredeemable and it calls for total rejection of state action and says that the only ethical action is revolutionary action against the state and towards decolonization. So um, that's a summary of the file. I'm going to I'm gonna stop my screen share for questions, but that's a summary of settler colonialism. How do I stop sharing? Questions about settler colonialism or anything we've talked about so far? Like before, I'm gonna give people a sec because I know that was a lot that we just um, blazed through. Okay, so Lena says, should we negate the Cray with pragmatism? Okay, so that is an argument that one can make against the alternative um and brooke will cover this a little bit more in the next lecture that we're doing in the afternoon um which will be about answering critiques but i would say that rather than pragmatism i think that there's some good arguments that could be made for um 
especially in the case of the burn it down alt, for there needing to be a little bit more like planning maybe um, around that and not just immediate rejection of the state. Because while the state is like unethical and premised on bad things, there are also a lot of people who depend on the state. Um, like native reservations would not be able to get a lot of their necessary like healthcare, food, stuff like that, if the state just like ceased operating immediately. Um, so there would need to be things set up around that to be able to like plan for that, that I don't think that an alt that absolute accounts for. Um, the other way that you could sort of use a pragmatism argument, I guess, against the other alt would be to talk about just like not being able to get everyone on board with that uh, and just like the unrealistic nature of being able to like get more people involved with movements like that um, or to get the state to change um, because of the power of the state and because of state backlash against things like the pro protest to Standing Rock and stuff like that. Um, I think there's a lot of logical arguments that you can make against alts. Um, and yeah, Burke will definitely get more into those in the next lecture. I'm a little bit confused as to what the, how does the AF use the K in their favor question means? Uh, do you want to elaborate on that out loud? Yeah. I think maybe like the, if maybe what, what Ryan is suggesting is, oh, no, I didn't respond. Maybe what Ryan is suggesting is, is like how the abolish ICE affirmative might be able to make the critique an offensive argument. Okay, so I think that there's definitely ways that you could say that the AF is in the direction of the K um, and that the AF is a movement towards uh, being able to do the critique, especially in the instance of an app like Abolish ICE. I think that a good argument could be made for like demilitarizing the border or like getting rid of ICE and stuff like that is a good first step towards being able to like build coalitions necessary to bring down the state, um, towards having more freedom of movement that's necessary for that, um, and towards being able to um, actually make things like that happen. And I think that you could make the argument that it's in the direction of the K and that um, it's not actually like legislating citizenship. It's not saying that like, oh, like all of these people immediately become citizens, but rather that it's getting rid of a policing entity um, that weakens the state in that regard. A lot of these things are just like, um, it really depends on the circumstance and you really just need to think through like how the arguments are going to interact and like how the actual like practicalities of it would interact. Um, Lillian asked, for the burn it down alt, is it more of a movement for us to physically burn it down or is it more of a thought experiment where we have to talk about it in debate and change our mindsets as kind of a first step to decolonization? Um, okay, so I think that you could explain this alt on both levels. I think that you can say that the alt itself, like in a world where you could fiat the alt, just like you can fiat the F, because I think that that's a whole nother conversation you can have, um, that you can say like, look, if we're like saying what we actually think should be done, we're saying we think we should physically burn down the state. Um, but in terms of like, this is just a debate round and obviously we're not going to be able to walk out of here and like torch all the police stations. Um, that it's a move towards unsettling the debate round um, and also getting more people on board with this idea that the state is irredeemable and that it is sort of a like, almost like, you know how people frame things as try or die? Like it's sort of a try or die for, we need to get rid of the state because it's unethical to let it continue any longer. And so that's sort of the moral position you're taking with this argument if that makes sense. Um, okay, so the end results of the embodied movements alternative, 
um, like, would it be possible to say the end result leads to the affirmative so you would be able to permit? I think that that is definitely a good argument that could be made against that alternative. Um, I think that the end result of the embodied movements alternative is meant to be decolonization. It's just meant to be like a slower approach to decolonization um, because the, the aim of it is definitely to get the attention of the state and to force concessions from the state in terms of allowing sovereignty over land um, or returning sovereignty to native people. And I think that you could say one of the steps along the way would definitely be abolishing ICE. Um, and so that the affirmative could just function as part of that. Uh, and that would definitely be a permutation that you could argue for. Um, yes, Fast and Furious is older than ICE. ICE uh, should go. Okay, um, how do we answer pragmatism? A lot of this is going to come down to sort of like framing and impact arguments. So when people are making arguments about pragmatism and what is or is not possible, first you can make arguments about fiat and just be like, look, you can't, like the half is never gonna happen either. Like Trump is the president. There's no way that Trump is ever gonna be like, oh yeah, we should abolish ICE. Um, even if Biden was president, there's no way that Biden's gonna be like, oh yeah, we should abolish ICE. Biden is an old racist man, um, but like, the idea that you should be able to fiat that but not be able to fiat oh yeah i think they were talking about the arguments that i was describing earlier about like what is or isn't possible um and like what like the like what the alternatives would end up looking like um and whether or not that's desirable so i think that it really depends on what arguments they make um, and like how that works in relation to both the AF and the critique, because a lot of these things, I think you can turn back around on the AF as to like, if you're saying that this is not something that's realistic in the critique, then why is it okay for you to make equally unrealistic st statements in the AF um, and stuff like that? I don't know if that answered all of those questions. Um, I think, yeah. That's what I had for that. Mm -hmm. Do we have mm -hmm. any more questions or? Um, I think you, you should definitely make an epistemological argument when you're doing arguments like settler colonialism because what you're arguing is that, so with epistemology, you're saying that the knowledge that they are producing is flawed in some way because it's settled, it's set on a foundation that is flawed. Um, and so with settler colonialism, you're saying that assuming the state is a legitimate entity is a flawed assumption um, and that producing knowledge from settlers is always going to reproduce knowledge of the settler state that is intended to uphold it. And so making arguments about how that means that their evidence is always going to be produced with a flawed epistemology that upholds the settler state um, and perpetuates itself is definitely a framing you should make about like why it's important to introduce these conversations in debate and why these forms of knowledge are important to include. To lunch. Um, so we had a couple guided questions. Brooke, do you want to start us off? Yeah. So the purpose of this discussion is really to kind of just make us think more critically ha, 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 <laughs> about how case work and where where they apply, what they're, you know, all, all the things about K. Let's start out with what about criminal justice reform? And, and this is a time where you can speak out loud or you can, you can talk in the chat, but this is a discussion that you can participate in whichever way feels comfortable. So for question number one, what about criminal justice reform might be uh, opinions that masquerade as fact? Like in criminal justice reform, what are some things that may be represented as factual that are really based in opinions or biases? Oh, I saw a finger. Yeah. <laughs> so it, that's a question that they want us to answer, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think um, one of those things are that 
black people commit more crimes than any other group, right? Mm -hmm. And so people try to manipulate the statistics to make it seem like we commit more crime than other folks. Because, I mean, we might be the ones that are intaken more, right? But we're also, I think we have the highest um, rate of getting off from those things, right? But then, you know, people want to conceal that part and just create the facade that Black people create, you know, commit more crimes than as opposed to their other counterparts, particularly like white folks, because white folks oftentimes have the luxury and the ability to have access to lawyers and access to other um, programs that are diversionary that stop them from being incarcerated, right? So it's like when Black people are convicted of like drug crimes, the often the move is to like just arrest us and put us in jail. However, for other particular racial groups, it's like, oh, we need to send you to get help or rehab or to get you into some program that'll help you be introduced into the community better or transition away from those um, drugs. So that's the thing. That's awesome. I think that's a great one to start out with. So. And, and, and I hope that you all may write some of these things down because the purpose of that question is not just for us to kind of just share it out just to, it's for us to really kind of think about it to carry with us is when we think about how we address this topic, you know, when we're thinking about who is a criminal, do we have an image in our mind? If I, if I told you to, all right, close your eyes, think of who a criminal is, who would you imagine when you close your eyes? You know, who might you imagine when, when I say, who's a doctor? Imagine a doctor. You know, the differences, the, the biases and the perspectives based off of the opinions that get touted as facts are important so that you don't adopt the biases and opinions of other people because they're not factual. Or who is a college professor and what does that look like? True. <laughs> True. Um, it's like you, Cooper. It looks like you. I mean, well, that's not the reaction I get in some other cases when I'm not so dressed professionally. Just take your hat and do it this way. It's like take <laughs> your hat. get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> but yeah, that's the professor style, Jasmine. <laughs> do we have any other ideas about? Um, things within the, the, the criminal justice reform topic that might be explained as factual that are really just an opinion or a biases or a stereotype. You could type it, you could say it. Crime rates, that's another one. Yeah, no, that's great. Crime rates are often how, you know, touted as like, there's crime is so high and it's just getting higher and you're like what really and you look at it and you're like it's been one carjacking this year and it wasn't none last year <laughs> you know in that respective area people are able to make it seem as if it is factual that crime rates are high when it's relative right it's relative to what previous year may have been. It's relative to that particular set of crime. It's relative to the type of offenders that might be going into here. It's so many things that go into specifically data collection that require that you think what biases, what stereotypes might exist, especially in criminal justice reform. Yeah, because like with statistics, um, when it comes to reporting those particular crimes, there could be such instances of over-reporting or under-reporting. Because like when you think about, um, so I don't know if you heard, but they were like, they were kind of reporting that domestic violence and child abuse is down right now. And it's like, mm -hmm. is it? But it's just like, no one's really reporting those crimes. So it looks like those things are down right now. But in some instances, a lot of people will over-report crimes, which make it seem like it is very inflated, like there's a lot of like crime and theft in a particular area because people are reporting um, a lot of those things. Um, particularly, and this is a little old example, but if you think about the Vietnam War, 
right? We were losing that period. We were losing the Vietnam War. But what they would do is underreport how many deaths or casualties there are happening in the Vietnam War. So it looked like to the American public, oh, we're winning. We're not dying as much, but wasn't true. Let's move on to question number two. Um, and Sai, if you want to jump in whenever, just let me know. Um, but I just wrote out a couple that we had talked about. So if you, uh, let's, let's, let's make one that's about like just a critique. If you don't defend a critique for the entirety of the round, not just the alternative, but if you decide that you want to kick out of the critique, is that unethical? If you made an argument about mm -hmm. <laughs> birthday twenty <21. laughs> <Yes! laughs> um, if you decide to kick out of the critique, does that mean that there is something unethical about you know your decision to do so? Are you showing conditional ethics? Dun dun dun. I, I mean, I can chime in really quickly about this. Um, I think it depends on the type of critique that you're running. Um, if the type of critique that you're running does not materially deal with particular lives of like indigenous, black folks, women, you know, things of that nature. If it's like Cap K, <laughs> kick out of it, whatever. Or Neil Lib, kick out of it. But like the problem is, and that I've seen is that, and this is something that I teach my debaters to do, that if a team kicks out of the anti-blackness arguments okay i'm like oh that's very interesting because i thought you said that black bodies are fungible and disposable and all that bad stuff but you just kicked the k that ethically says that those things are bad kind of interesting how that works so oh yeah 100 percent agree on that um yeah sorry i got strong feelings about that because my partner okay so my debate partner is uh, or like from high school, my debate partner is an indigenous person. Um, and so she would get very heated when people ran the settler colonialism critique and they kicked out of it. Because like we just talked about, it's a critique that's literally about how the country is built on genocide. Um, and how that means that like the country itself is unethical. And then you're just gonna kick it later in the debate and just be like, JK, about all the genocide stuff and stuff that really affects people, wasn't really serious about it. Um, and yeah, one time we debated a team who tried to do that against us and uh, she just yelled at them for like the whole 2AC and then we won on, you can't kick a or that their conditionality for uh, settler colonialism critique was unethical. So, yeah, don't do that. Don't be, yeah. Jasmine, talk. <laughs> well, I just wanted to, you know, I wanted to raise my hand so I can get <laughs> um, Yeah, I, I, I agree a lot, like, with everything that um, the others have said. I think that maybe something in addition is just, what is the difference between kicking the entirety of the critique versus not going for the alternative or um, not going for a large portion of the critique to make an argument um, on case, right? So a lot of these things are going to matter if you are negative versus like a policy affirmative. Um, I've got a lot of questions as to what was in the 1 and C that meant that you're no longer going for the critique anymore um, and going for the, like, what else you had going on in the debate. Um, but also, if you are debating, like, a more critical affirmative, my answer also kind of, like, changes. But also what's happening in the debate is a little bit different um, if it's, like, a K versus um, a KF. And so... What I mean by choosing to go for the alternative uh, or not choosing to go for the alternative is that you are in a world where you're not going for the all, you're going for like a case turn, right? You're going for a link um, as a case turn to the affirmative absent any way to resolve that because you're negative, right? You could be like, you know what? The app is just bad. We don't have to solve for why the app is bad. The app just leads to something that is net worse or what more bad 
better uh, than what they attempt to say is what they solve for. Um, and so the world, you're like, mm, they're, re they're, they're wedding largely that our alternative doesn't do anything, not spend enough time on it. I'm not really explaining what it is and how it does all this stuff. But you know what, where I am winning that link debate. And you know what I do think is still true? It affects how the affirmative gets to go for case outweighs or our F is the most important thing. But if you are debating, let's say a policy F, which by the way, I'm confused if you're kicking out of it because you're going for like the dissed. Uh, for example, that block division, I got questions. And this is all presuming that you went for set call, anti-blackness, like type of critique. If you went for the cap K, I'm with it. I'm with <laughs> all the stuff, right? Um, but in that world, you gotta go for the you, you gotta go for some portion of like the link argument or this like theory argument that you've made because on a very simple, simple, simple level, you have said something not only kind of substantively, like so like what the content, what the cards of the affirmative are that are bad, that assume certain things that your theory says is bad but you are also uh, critiquing their kind of movement in debate, right? What they are doing in the round and why it proves this larger structural thing, this big picture thing that you are describing about the world, which means that you have to create some kind of distinction to the question of, well, what about you? What about me? What, how are you choosing to engage in the debate space? And how is it different than how the affirmative you have pinpointed is bad? You kicking out of the critique that you went one off for, hopefully, this is the world that it makes sense. Um, I'm gonna say, so what is the ability to kick out of that? Is that not appealing to some type of thing about debate that you are critiquing is bad? Does that prove that we don't have to be as ingenuous about you know, if we go for the permutation, we actually don't have to care about the substance of what you're talking about, because if it all comes down to just like the debate tricks of, well, if you get a kick out of the um, alternative or kick out of the critique, our permutation doesn't really have to care or solve for anything that you're describing, because it's all about just doing it until you no longer want to do it. This puts it in a very hard place for the judge, for me, myself, and I, and I think the panel here, or like, Okay, so you've made the debate harder for us to reconcile because the app is now bad because they've done some things, but then you've done it too. And so now I'm just kind of like, how do I resolve this? What is net worse? And so if you don't want confused face Jasmine Judge, I can only speak for myself, but I do know it does create some kind of like, man, now I got to figure out this debate on some other line. Don't do it. Don't. Yeah, and just one thing I wanted to add for the conditionality um, portion, because somebody was asking that. Uh, I definitely agree with every, what everybody else says about um, the ethics of conditionality. The question I want to answer, though, is something I usually get from a lot of novice and JV debaters whenever they're starting out. They usually hear this argument out of context, and they're like, oh, you can't kick out of things because that's unethical, but they don't know um, the story behind it or, like, the justification. Um, and usually, like, like the other panel has said, it's if you make that argument, like uh, an ethical argument that is like kind of based on identity. Uh, usually when I get this question of like, we don't want to kick out of things from JV and novice debaters, uh, they're confused about the multiple worlds argument, right? So just emphasizing the like the role of the neck in policy debate, multiple wor worlds is like, it's granted to them, right? So understanding where that rule comes from is important in order to like answer why conditionality is bad in the first place. Like if you're only running one off and it's a cap K, this is usually the most basic K that everybody runs, right? Sometimes you have a more experienced debater on app. It's like, oh, well, you're kicking out of the cap K. That's an ethical. And they just kind of throw it out there to kind of intimidate debaters. Um, it's really important to know that like, if you're running cap K, it's not really identity based, right? And if there's a policy team, sometimes they'll just throw that argument out too. It's really in important to know the context of why conditionality is unethical, um, and especially when the history of like K debate 
and like framework teams and policy debate, it's really important to distinguish those things and not just kind of like throw out, oh yeah, conditionality is bad, right? Because that also kind of like overlooks the history of like why K debate became what it was in the first place. Um, and also uh, it doesn't really um, help uh, uh, growing debaters give more context to so, like they could run more than 1k or other multiple arguments and they're just kind of scared because they don't understand the origin of that argument. So I just wanted to clarify that it's not like you can't cook kick out of the cap K, for example, if you're running like multiple things right it's important to contextualize those arguments and in order to understand it. One thing to wrap up this question because we got a couple more that we can maybe move through is uh, and, and for this is just for you know in case you're taking notes or you're looking for different strategies because we talked about how a critique is one of the most natural arguments in debate and so if we if we can think of like the idea of it being conditional of your of you or you being able to kick out of this critique then has some underlying thing behind it that's something that you can make on the app you know that's a that's a way that you can make your critique on the app without necessarily, um, you know, having all the regular components or structuring it in the exact same way that you might read an off case critique um, when you're negative. So just remember that that's a, that, that is something that you can consider um, and you should be mindful of different things in the round that might be like be indicative of someone's interpretation of reality that has biases, stereotypes, or is an opinion that is